Welcome to From Striving to Thriving. I am Diana Hill, and I like to see myself as your psychological flexibility guide. What that means is my goal is to really help you identify your values, what matters to you, and to pursue those values and to pursue a rich and meaningful life even in the face of adversity and challenge and uncertainty. And today I'm going to be exploring striving with you from my personal experience as a, sort of a frenemy to striving is what I say, that striving has been my friend in many ways, helped me do things like organize the summit, but also has uh, been really challenging to me in my life in terms of leading me to burnout, contributing to an eating disorder and contributing to uh, sometimes having a really narrowed individualistic focus. We're going to be exploring striving in lots of different ways and really with this angle of acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT uh, at its core. I'm going to be talking to you about really two different forms of striving, inflexible striving and, and how it may keep you stuck in your life and heading in directions that you don't want to be headed. Uh, and then I'll be talking to you about skillful striving and three specific skills that you will be able to apply here and now today to your life to help you move towards more health and vitality wholeness and a feeling of commitment in your life towards what really matters most to you. The three skills that we'll be exploring are your values, compassion, and wise effort. And I would like for us to start with a simple gata, which is a short statement that uh, we can say to ourselves with our breath. It's sort of like a mantra to help us all get into this moment. You may be folding your laundry or washing your dishes, or maybe you're driving or walking, multitasking. But this short gata is, is one that I learned from Thich Nhat Hanh uh, almost tw 20 years ago when I visited Plum Village uh, with my partner. And then I was reminded again of this past year when we went back with our little family of four to his monastery in Southern France. The gata is breathing in, I have arrived and breathing out, I am home. Try it with me. Breathing in, I have arrived. Allow yourself to arrive to this summit, to be here now and take a moment to land in this moment, your surroundings, your body. And breathing out, I am home. Can you feel a sense of being home within yourself? Maybe even a sense of being part of something, a sense of belonging, that there are people from all over the world that are watching this, different asynchronous you know, times, but we're all watching and connecting with the same information of these thought leaders and spiritual teachers and neuroscientists that have gathered together. And we can feel at home together as a larger family. Breathing in, I have arrived, and breathing out, I am home. And as you land here, I'd also like for you to imagine that you have a timeline and the timeline goes back in time to one side and forward in time to the, to the other. And as you go back along the timeline, there was a moment when you first signed up for this summit. There was something that caught your eye about it in your past. There was something that was either had some interest, curiosity, maybe you wanted to hear from one of the teachers here. Maybe there was something that you were longing for or wanting for yourself. There was something that you cared about that made you sign up and take this time to be here. And I want you to sort of hold that with one hand, this thing that I care about that brought me here to take this time, to set it aside. Hold that care in one hand. This is uh, in many ways your values that brought you here. And then you can also imagine that the timeline is going to go forward in time, right? And you're going to leave the summit and you're going to take some information from it. You're going to take some experiences and stories. There's a lot of incredible stories that these uh, thought leaders have shared in these different interviews and conversations. And you're going to have had a very personal experience. And I want you to hold that personal experience of the present moment and imagine that we're going to go off into the future and it were to maybe create something for you, something that you're hoping for, 
whether it's for you as an individual, you within your, your family, your partnerships, your relationships, you on this planet and the many people that we are collectively together with on this planet, what is your hope? So that you can hold your values and your the reason why you are here in one hand and you can hold your hope in the other hand. And I'm holding those two as well. The reason why I showed up and made this summit for you and the hope that I hold of how it will impact your life. And then take those two hands and just put them together. And breathing in, I have arrived. Holding my values and my hope and breathing out, I'm home. So let us begin. There is a metaphor that I learned from Chris Frazier, who's a psychologist, uh, about a bird getting stuck in a building. And we've all had this experience when a bird has maybe gotten caught in your kitchen and it's flying about and it's trying to get out. And, and what does the bird do? It flies for the window, right? That's what birds do. They fly up and out towards the trees. They're, they're designed, evolutionary designed to do that when they're, when they're stuck. But inevitably, the bird flies up and out towards the window and boom, hits the window and falls back on the ground. And sure enough, what will the bird do? It'll get up and do that again up and out towards the window, boom. And maybe if you're in the kitchen with them, you may get out your broom and kind of try and get them going in a different direction, or you may uh, you know, find a trash can or a blanket or you know, try and help them get out. But what's interesting about birds is that if you give it enough time, it'll eventually kind of get on the ground and kind of walk around and, and find another way out. And when it does, it flies up and out. And the reason why I'm bringing this metaphor up for you is because I think a lot of us, when we are stuck in unskillful habits, unskillful striving, we're much like that bird at the window. The bird in the kitchen where maybe we've done the same thing over and over again, and it's worked for us in our life. We're high achievers. We are um, really good at like pushing ourselves. Uh, we do the same thing that we've done and has worked in other arenas of our life, but many of us are finding that that's not working in the same way. That type of high achievement or trying to control things or um, fix things, problem solve things, doesn't work so well with our emotional lives, with our relationships, or with this grander feeling of um, existential uncertainty that we're facing. And really the only way out is to do something different, to look another way, see another view, have a different perspective. And then we still fly. We still need to move. And notice that I didn't say the bird or you don't have to like give up who you are and stop flying, but maybe do something a little bit differently. In act, when we recognize that we're a bird caught in a kitchen trying to fly out a window and banging our head against the wall for the millionth time. That's called creative hopelessness. Creative hopelessness. So the hopeless part is really important. I'm not saying that you are hopeless or I am hopeless because I've hit my head against many windows before. I'm saying the behavior is hopeless. It's no longer working for you. And in many ways, the behavior of our, um, our grander uh, communities, the ways in which we have divisiveness between people in towns or people in countries is, is hopeless. The behavior is not working. But cr the creativity part is the fun part, which is being able to have what Dan Siegel is a more consilient perspective, where we can bring in different ideas, where we have more variability in our life. And maybe we can orient ourselves towards what we care most about and find a different path out. Last year when I started this summit, I shared about a little bit about my story of why I got it started and how it really began for me um, in the summer of 2020. I was at a place where um, not only was I feeling completely physically exhausted by being a therapist and by being a working parent, I was also at a place where 
I was going back to my old behaviors that were making things worse. So for me, as a uh, when I when I get stuck, my flying against a window has to do with perfectionism, doing more, not stopping to listen to my body. And I was waking up in the middle of the night and working, not able to sleep because I was feeling so much stress. And so I, I wrote down this list of things that I was doing, basically, and then I was seeing my clients doing that was contributing to them, you know, hitting their heads against the wall. And it's the sort of the inflexible striving list. And as I read through this list, you can use your fingers to kind of check off for yourself which ones of these you relate to. So the first one is doing more, but not feeling like you're doing enough. Using work and doing to avoid feelings that you aren't good enough. Starting so many projects that you can't stay focused or over-focusing on something that leads you to neglect important domains of your life. Believing your inner critic and judge is true. Avoiding taking risks, like I'm never going to go out that open window because I'm afraid that I will fail. Competing with people who don't have the same goals of you and having this sense of scarcity. There's not enough for me. Avoiding taking time off, enjoying your life or resting because you feel guilty. And then maybe reaching some big achievements only to quickly move on to the next line. So it's as if the finish line keeps on moving out in front of you. Around that time, I started to read this um, poet, Rupi Kaur, who's written on productivity guilt and productivity anxiety. In one of her really short poems called Productivity Guilt, she writes, I measure my self-worth by how productive I've been, but no matter how hard I work, I still feel inadequate. She went on to write a, a Facebook uh, post about this piece and said, I don't know where this productivity guilt comes from. It's probably many places. No amount of work feels like it's enough. The more I do, the more the inadequacy increases. I think, okay, I'll just do this one thing and then I'll take a break. Okay, maybe this too and that and this and boom. Years went by with me too scared to slow down scared that if I did, I would disappear into the abyss and everything I know would turn to dust. This insecurity meant a heart filled with constant anxiety. It took me getting sick to realize I could not allow my output to define me. What I made was not my only value. Many of us feel this sickness inside and we see the sickness around us, the sickness of racism, the sickness of division, the sickness of a pandemic, the sickness of our own bodies, the sickness of our children, and our attempts to approach it with this individualistic striving view are just making us more sick. In ACT, there's a concept called functional contextualism. And I want to kind of break that down for us as it relates to our striving. The functional part is the idea that in some way, the behaviors that we're engaging in, this individualistic approach or this competitive, um, me-focused way of living, functioned for us. And it functioned within a certain context, right? Our education system, which has a context of competition and comparison. Uh, our capitalistic society, a patriarchy. It functions well for us in that way. And even if it's not functioning in terms of our, our mental wellness and our holistic health. So sometimes I'll talk with clients about, you know, sort of seeing themselves like a Russian doll, you know, those little wooden stacking dolls that, you know, I used to buy them for my kids, but my kids would rarely <laughs> play with them as much as I would. I thought they were so cute. And I love to get to that little tiny doll at the, at the beginning. And you can think about this for yourself. Like these Russian stacking dolls are... The, the different contexts that are influencing our behavior and, and why we're kind of getting stuck in this unhealthy way of striving. The tiniest doll is your brain. 
your brain. And our brains evolved to have a, a feeling of scarcity, to, to seek out resources, this sort of drive system of there's not enough, so I better go find it. Our brains evolved this negativity bias. Our brains have also evolved to avoid pain. And in a world where there is a lot of suffering, avoiding pain may be things like shutting down, going back in bed, not thinking about it, um, not doing anything about it, right? Which can lead to inactivity and lead to things not changing. It can also, suppressing that pain can also lead to a rebound effect of you don't know how to be with suffering. The gates of grief as Francis Weller talks about, that we will all go through many gates of grief in our life. And many of us don't have the capacity to be with that difficulty. So we have our brain. And then the next layer on top of our brain is our childhood experience. And you can think about what was modeled to you about achieving and getting ahead and striving. What, what was reinforced in your early childhood experience, either from coaches or from teachers or your own family, the, the sort of subtle and not so subtle ways in which you as an individual were, were praised for certain things or punished for others. When I was uh, growing up, somehow I learned that if I tilt my head slightly to the one side and I smile, I think people liked me a little bit more. Or maybe I got more attention. And to this day, if you watch videos of me, I have a slight head tilt at all times. <laughs> my environment shaped that, right? I learned if you do this, you're more likable. And it had cons it has consequences for my spine health, right? But we, we learn things from our, um, our early childhood experiences. And then the next layer of the Russian doll is this society that we live in, the social context of what is reinforced, especially in the West and the United States, in terms of um, capitalism and individualistic focus. And then finally, the last, the last Russian doll has to do with our behavior. And this is the one that I'm really interested in, is how are we operating in the world now? How have we taken these stories and like begun to believe them about ourselves and behave in a way that is reinforcing our suffering, really, us hitting our heads against the wall? Paul Gilbert, who was on our last summit and is just an incredible human being, founder of Compassionate Mind Foundation, has this line that he says with folks, which is, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. And oftentimes I will tell clients what, whatever they're stuck in, whether it's an addiction or an eating disorder or depression or anxiety or, um, you know, relationship problems with their spouse, it's not your fault. Of course, it makes sense. And it makes sense in the context that you are in. You are doing everything that society and your brain and your early childhood experiences and your learning history have shaped you to do and have told you that it's going to make you happy and survive. And it's not working for you. Sonia Renee Taylor, who wrote Your Body is Not an Apology, talks about uh, our body image origin story? Like when was that time when you started to think there was something wrong with you and your body? And tracing back to that moment of loss of how you may have felt different at some point. And I think you have a striving origin story as well. When I teach yoga for, with kids, I kind of watch their progression. And when they're kindergartners and first graders and second graders, they are so free in their bodies. They're spinning around, they're doing circles. When I say, let's all do an animal pose, they're going in the center and being animals. They're holding hands with each other and doing partner yoga. And then something happens between fourth and fifth grade where all of a sudden these children are no longer free in themselves. You know, they're kind of socially conscious. What, what is this person gonna think? I don't wanna make a fool of myself. And you have that too. You know, there's been probably, if you trace back, there was early on a, a moment when you were free to be you early on in your life that maybe changed over time. On this summit, we're going to get a chance to do some movement with Dan Siegel, the very end of his talk, which I would not miss. It's the best part of his whole talk. Dan was a, was a dancer for much of his life, a dancer. You know, here's this neuroscientist that has this background in dance and the freedom to be able to come back to our bodies and be ourselves in that way again and connect in that way. 
So what about for you? What is your striving origin story? When did things kind of shift for you that you felt like you no longer could be fully you? You began to feel maybe disconnected from others or disconnected from nature. And you lost that feeling of being at home in the present moment. In Buddhism, there is the four noble truths. The first noble truth being that life is suffering or that there's dissatisfaction in life. And the second noble truth has to do with the causes of our suffering. And the causes of our suffering are things like attachment, trying to hold on when good things happen, like, ooh, I got a lot of followers from a post. I want to hold on to my numbers in social media. Or maybe for somebody else, it's uh, achievements in a job, right? Attachment. Or, or maybe for someone else, it's their skin. Attachment to smooth skin, right? And then that can cause suffering because the nature of life is that everything is impermanent. And if you hold on to something that's changing, it's going to give you a little bit of rope burn. Another cause of our suffering is avoidance and in not wanting to feel discomfort, avoiding pain, whether it's physical pain or it's grief or it's fear. And our avoidance of pain also contributes to our suffering because when you're avoiding pain, you also are avoiding some of the most meaningful things in life. You can't become a parent or uh, care about an animal or care about our planet without experiencing some degree of pain. The third aspect of our suffering, of what contributes to our suffering, is our delusions, our beliefs that are completely off <laughs> about the world and how it works. When it comes to striving, it really can be an experience of attachment and avoidance and some degree of delusion. So if we look at the attachment part of striving, we are attached to self-promotion. Like, do you spend a lot of time and energy curating and promoting your image? We're attached to um, our individual pursuits, maybe seeing your successes as personal and discounting context, discounting privilege, discounting others' contributions. We are attached and over-identified with our egos and our sense of worth being based on our work. Do you see your worth as based on your performance of how you do, your appearance or your finances? And striving as attachment is also an attachment to reassurance seeking. Like, tell me I'm good enough. That seeking out of, did I do a good job? People pleasing, um, addicted to likes and approval ratings. And then we're just attached to things. Maybe you work to gain more material goods, status, followers, platforms, citations, degrees, whatever it is, trophies that gives you a sense of, I'm good enough. Striving can also be experiential avoidance. So what I tend to do when I get stressed is I like to rush through things. If I speak really quickly through this talk, then maybe I don't have to feel the anxiety that's happening in my body right now or the constriction of my breath. We experientially avoid through striving by just doing stuff maybe multitasking, overworking, overscheduling our days so we don't have to be with stillness, boredom, disconnection in our relationships, our loneliness. We experientially avoid by bracing ourselves. Many of us are holding our breaths, our shoulders are to our ears, our bellies are sucked in, as society has told women in particular to do. And we clench our jaw because we're bracing against feeling. We're scared to feel. We also can intellectualize and overthink things. Uh, when I was interviewing these different folks, I, I would notice my head getting so busy around what I was gonna say next that I would lose contact with the human that was sharing and transmitting this incredible teaching to all of us. So getting into our heads is actually a way of avoiding sometimes a little bit of anxiety or depression or other types of uncomfortable feelings. And then our favorite form of avoidance and experiential avoidance for many of us is just numbing out, using substances, using foods, ignoring our hunger and fullness, ignoring our body signals for rest. And we get caught up in this avoidance we get caught up in this attachment. We get caught up in the sort of delusions of self of who we think we are when we are in unhealthy striving. It leads to sort of these behavior loops 
maybe uh, discomfort shows up because you're going to go to a social event. And so you spend a lot of time fixing yourself, fixing your hair, fixing your clothes. Or maybe you spend a lot of time uh, promoting yourself. This is who I am. This is what I do. This is how I have worth. Or maybe you spend a lot of time hiding yourself. I am nothing. I don't belong here. So we feel the cues of discomfort, the discomfort of living on this planet show up for us. And then we go into these avoidance and attachment behaviors that have consequences for us. We get burned out. We get irritable with our family. We neglect our body's needs and we feel increasingly disconnected from one another. So you have your own stuck loop. I know you do. You have you, you signed up for from striving to thriving. So I imagine you have the things that you do that are hitting your head against that window, that bird that's caught in the kitchen. We are all birds caught in the kitchen trying to get out and hitting our heads against windows of striving. And I want to help you find another way. Because oftentimes, if you're a high achiever like me, you probably have received comments from other people that say things like, just don't work so hard. You should get a massage. <laughs> take a break. Take some time off. Don't be such a perfectionist. And what I find is that that is kind of invalidating because I'm a, I'm a flyer. <laughs> I like to fly. I want to fly. There's, there's big things that I want to do in this world. And I want to make a change in whatever way I can with the gifts that I've been given. And I know that you do too. There's things you want to do in the world. There's a change that you want to make in your life, in the community that you live in. And I don't want to tell you not to work so hard. I don't want to tell you to take a break. What I want to help you do is to get into contact with your values, to get to know your system and your body and what it needs to thrive. And then to act from those values with an awareness of your well-being and how your well-being impacts the well-being of people around you so that you dial up the perfectionism when you need it and you dial it down when it's not useful for you. In the summer of 2020, I also, like many white Americans, became aware of my whiteness, <laughs> which is such a kind of horrific thing to say, given how much my whiteness and my history and my ancestors have caused suffering in America and across the world. And in that um, sort of white guilt that I went into that is not helpful, I started to get sort of striving around that of like, okay, how am I going to, you know, how am I going to fix this fast, right? Because again, I rush through things when I'm feeling pain. And I slowed down and looked at the APA guidelines on race and ethnicity for uh, psychologists. And on that list was a number of names of leaders in the field who contributed to these guidelines lines, Karen Suyamoto, Helen Neville, Sandra Matar. I had an opportunity to speak with a number of them. And the conversations that I had led me to understand at a deeper, in a deeper way the concepts of um, interconnection, how we can use the past to inform us in the present, and radical hope for the future. I also read through these guidelines and saw the word strive in many of them. So psychologists strive to recognize and engage in the influence of race and ethnicity in all aspects of professional activities as an ongoing process. There's no end point for this. It is a process that we are striving in. Psychologists are encouraged to maintain up updated knowledge and strive for awareness of their own positionality in relation to ethnicity and race. Psychologists strive to address organizational and social inequities. And this concept of striving kind of had like a, a different flavor to uh, the way that I've used, viewed striving in the past. It had a flavor of striving as in putting your full effort into something to promote change that's a process. There's no, there's no end point. 
So I want to ask you, like, what if you could strive more skillfully towards what you care about? You could aim high, like those birds, without burning out, without getting your head smashed against the wall. And during that time, I, I wrote in my journal another list. And this was my, my aspiration, my hope, right, that I held with, with one hand. It's, it was an aspiration for skillful striving for me, for my clients, for my kids, for each other. And this form of skillful striving was about being present and engaged in our work, setting goals that are based on our values, flexibly attending to the important domains of our lives, pausing, pausing to take in the good of our achievements and the good of this moment, breathing in, I have arrived, breathing out, I am home. Being encouraging, kind, and motivating when you make mistakes. Courageously taking risks outside your comfort zone. Being the bird that turns around and looks out a different window than maybe the window you've been looking out of. And taking a step. Feeling meaning and purpose and belonging in what you do. And then also knowing how to set boundaries and take time off, even if you feel guilty. This was my um, sort of new way of looking at skillful striving. And it had these, these components, these three components to it of, of values, tuning in to what brings you meaning and, and psychological richness in your life, compassion, to have this compassionate, caring mind for yourself and for others, and wise effort, taking action, living in a, a values-based way with your hands and your feet. So if you were to get out of this kitchen... <laughs> Stop hitting your head against the wall. What's, what's worth flying for, for you? What's important to you? And if, if I were to videotape you for the rest of the day today, and you were to maybe send that video to me, and you were to say, this is me in line with the type of person that I want to be in the world, in line with the mom I want to be, the dad I want to be, the brother I want to be, the steward of this planet that I want to be, the anti-racist that I want to be, the um, committed worker that I want to be, what behaviors would I see you doing? Because those behaviors, those actions are your values. Values are um, both the seed and the fruit. Thich Nhat Hanh, who is my root teacher, talks about mindfulness being a seed and a fruit. It's the seed that we plant in the present moment to create the future that we want for ourselves. And it's the fruit that we enjoy in the present moment, to enjoy. To enjoy your values and what it feels intrinsically inside of yourself to live in a way that's aligned is the fruit of your values. And to live your values out through your actions are the seeds that you're planting and watering to create the garden of your life. The life that you have right now has a lot of contextual factors that influence you, systemic factors. If you're a person of color or a marginalized community, systemic factors that, that have impacted you. And it also has factors that are from the inside that have helped you respond to the systemic factors, the seeds that you've watered over time. So values are not necessarily about comfort and pleasure, but oftentimes the things that are meaningful to you can be the things that are most painful to you. Aaron Westgate, who I've interviewed on Your Life in Process podcast, talks about the good life and these three separate constructs that are involved in leading a good life. One of those constructs has to do with happiness, to have a sense of comfort, to have security, to have joy. And Alyssa Eppel talks about the importance of joy and optimism and our well-being at the cellular level. It's sort of anti-aging, right? That happiness is important for a good life. But there's two other components that are also important to you. One is having a meaningful life, having a sense of significance and purpose and coherence. And the psychologically rich life, which is about having variety and perspective shifts and being interested. These two parts, the meaningful and psychologically rich life, I think are really closely linked to living your values. And when you have a meaningful life, 
you're more likely to have social contribution. You're more likely to feel enriched, part of something greater, to have a deeper form of satisfaction. And when you have a psychologically rich life, this sort of perspective shifts that happen, that you're going to have happen on the summit by listening to all these leaders and teachers, it leads to wisdom. So values make you more vulnerable. They actually don't protect you from pain. And they're more than just a list of things. Like you can list values, you know, people write down lists, but I'm more interested in like, if you were to look back over your day yesterday, what was most meaningful to you? You may be surprised about the meaningful moments. If you were to look back over your life, what do you regret? Because pain also points to our values. The things that are painful for you, the things that you regret say a lot about the type of person that you want to be in the world. Daniel Pink, who has written The Power of Regret and I had the opportunity to talk to on your life and process, shares about these four types of regrets. So you can have foundation regrets, which are like, I wish that I brushed my teeth and flossed because man, my teeth aren't you know, doing so well. You can have connection regrets, those opportunities, those sliding door moments that you haven't walked through to connect with somebody and maybe those relationships that you let kind of fall apart over time by not tending to them. The third type of regret you can have are boldness regrets. The moments where you just didn't stand up and say something or take an opportunity or a risk. And then moral regrets, how you may have harmed yourself, harmed others, harmed the planet. And all of these forms of regret tell you a lot about what's important to you and how you may want to live your life. As Stephen Hayes, who is the founder or co-founder of Act says, um, love is the only thing. So it often boils down to love. Your values and living your values are a process. There's no end point. It's like pointing your body north. You're not going to get there. And you can point your body north right now and right here. So what do you want to do today that would lead your day to feel more aligned, more meaningful? more psychologically rich, and maybe actually stepping into some discomfort and pain along the way. Vulnerability. Thich Nhat Hanh says that there is no way to happiness. Happiness is the way. And values are the same. There's no way to values. Values are the way. So that's your first skill for skillful striving is, is values, knowing what matters to you and taking action in line with those values. And when you do that, you become what's called psychologically flexible. Psychological flexibility is a concept that's been researched for over 40 years. There's over 900 studies at this point on ACT and psychological flexibility and its benefit for everything from chess players to psychosis to OCD to eating concerns to body shame to anxiety, that when you are more psychologically flexible, when you know what matters to you and you take committed action towards those values, then your life opens up in a way that allows you to be with the uncertainty of living and live more deeply, more connected. The second skill that I wanna talk about is compassion. And I often will say in my workshops, mindfulness is so 2000 and compassion is so 2022. It's like the new mindfulness. So prepare for um, a lot more information coming out on compassion, but we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because mindfulness is at the foundation of having a compassionate mind. You have to have presence and to be able to be present with suffering in order to take action to alleviate suffering. Those are the two wings of compassion, to be present with, to suffer with, that calm passion, in the definition of the word, and to take action, to turn towards suffering with kindness, a kind heart. Paul Gilbert it describes compassion as having this flow of flowing three ways. So you can receive compassion from others. Maybe when you're hurting and, and somebody calls you, do you kind of block them out like, oh, I don't want to talk to anyone right now. I'm, I'm hurting so much. I don't want to let them in. 
Or do you let them in and allow them to soothe you and feel supported? You can give compassion to others when somebody you love is hurting or when somebody you don't know is hurting or when a group of people are hurting. Can you feel with them? Can you feel the hurt? Can you understand it in a deep way and take perspective of what this is like for you? And do you take action to alleviate that? You can give compassion. And then we can give compassion to ourselves. This term self-compassion that has over 4,000 studies right now, really led by Kristen Neff and others. And Kristen Neff talks a lot about self-compassion on the last summit, last year's summit, if you want to check out my interview with her. But this concept of how am I with myself when I am suffering? Am I critical? Am I harsh? Do I beat myself up? Do I push myself? Or am I with my suffering in a way that allows me to have the courage and encouragement to be able to do something to help myself out? There's some interesting research coming out during COVID around fears of compassion and uh, Marcella Matos and her team of people across 21 different countries have looked at people's fears around giving and receiving compassion. So fears of compassion include things like when you fear that being kinder to yourself will lead you to have your standards drop, or when you fear that being kind to other people will lead them to take advantage of you, or when you fear that taking in compassion will make you kind of like weak. And so you put up a barrier. And what's interesting in Marcella Matos' uh, research is that People that have higher fears of compassion as rated by the fears of compassion scale. I'll put a link down below so you can go take it for yourself. But people who have higher fears of compassion actually navigated the stressors of COVID worse. They had more depression and anxiety and less of a sense of social safeness. So we can work on building our compassion by working on building our capacity to be present with discomfort. Breathing in, I have arrived. Breathing out, I am home. So we arrive in the present moment with whatever is present in this moment. And we also can build our capacity for compassion by being able to bring kindness, care, and commitment to take care of our feelings, to take care of others' feelings in the present moment. Compassion has a tremendous amount of benefits, including well-being and resilience and better relationships and positive body image and lower inflammation in your body. There's some great research looking at compassion and uh, telomeres. So uh, telomeres is sort of a measure of your cellular aging, the, the little end caps of your DNA that protect your DNA, and they get shorter over time. And as they get shorter, there's greater risk for, you know, DNA damage. But with compassion, we see longer telomeres. And with compassion, and particularly self-compassion, we actually see that people don't have as much narcissism. You know, I, I'm part of the self-esteem movement where we were told, like, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and gosh darn it, people like you. And self-esteem has a little bit of a negative side effect in that if you have higher self-esteem, you also may rate higher on narcissism. You also may not bounce back as easily when you fall down from up here. With compassion and self-compassion, you actually are motivated to improve. It's not saying that you're perfect. Your behaviors still have room to improve. And you're good as you are. You are worthy as you are. So some ways that you can cultivate compassion in yourself is just with that mantra. Breathing in, I have arrived. Breathing out, I am home. And then also beginning to, throughout your day, have a check-in with one eye in and one eye out. How am I doing in this moment? How's your body right now? Are you in your head or in your body? What's going on? What needs tending? And how is this world around me doing in this moment? How are you doing? What needs tending? What do you need? What do I need? What do we need? We can also practice compassion by doing more uh, constructive rest. And Alyssa Eppel and Alexandra Kossel will talk about what that means to do what they call deep rest. I, I use the term constructive rest often as a yoga teacher of resting in a way that allows your attention to restore, your physical body to restore, your emotional self to restore, 
uh, your communities to restore. And Alyssa connected me with the work of Trisha Hershey from the NAP Ministry, who writes beautifully about how rest and sleep are a social justice issue because many folks have been working harder and have not had a chance to rest. And rest is not something that you have to work to get to. It's actually rest that every human's body deserves. You can think about for yourself what are micro rests that you can do in your day. Things like lying on the floor, nature breaks, um, taking naps, taking a lunch where you just allow yourself to eat. And then bigger macro breaks for yourself. Mental health days, taking time to go on a retreat, developing an evening ritual, as Alexandra and um, Alyssa talk about. And we can allow each other to rest. We can give space and time to rest. If you are a leader, incorporating in rest into your workspace. See that people are burned out and they need a break. And how can you include that break as part of your culture of thriving in the workplace? Whether that's social breaks to let people gather and have social time together, or breaks during their day to go for a hike, or even doing working meetings while you're walking. But thinking about how we can give compassion to each other by offering a chance to rest and give compassion to ourselves by taking in the opportunity. The third skill that we are gonna learn is wise effort, which is really taking deliberate action towards your values. My mom, who, and well, both my parents were followers of Thich Nhat Hanh, and they were on the last retreat that Thai taught at Plum Village before he had a stroke in 2014. And this was a 21 day retreat that was actually centered around death and dying. And during the talk, my mom would hand paint in her journal the images of Tai at the front of the Sangha teaching, as well as transcribe some of his writings. I have some of the uh, images on my social media. So if you want to look at Instagram to see those, you can. But in one of the transcriptions, she wrote down some words about wise effort, which really comes from a Buddhist tradition. It's also sometimes called right effort or right diligence. So Thich Nhat Hanh said, right diligence or right effort is the practice of choosing the right seeds, planting them and watering them. If you want those around you to be happy, choose the correct seeds and nourish them. Make this a habit. In many ways, Thich Nhat Hanh was a behavioral psychologist. He really saw the benefits of daily deliberate practice and how that changes our brain, those habits build over time and also strengthen the seeds of the gardens that we want to grow. We spend a lot of time trying to put pesticide on things or pull out weeds, but are you spending a lot of time on watering seeds? So maybe the weeds of your mind are things like thoughts that you don't like, but you have more power over watering the seeds of your values than you do on pulling out the weeds of negative thoughts. It's sort of an endless pile. They'll, they'll keep coming back. It's like crabgrass. Uh, and in a lot of ways, you're spending a lot of time and energy on something that is exhausting. So in ACT, we have a term called committed action. And committed action is action in the direction of what you care about, even in the presence of obstacles. And that's the definition by DJ Moran. Committed action involves taking small steps towards that vision of what you want to be in the world. And you can do committed action in a lot of different domains of your life. So you can have committed action towards your values in terms of your friendships or your health or your leisure time, your creative expression, your physical self-care. It's not about shoulds. It's not about rules, but it's about the, the values within this domain, the type of person you want to be, carrying them out with your hands and your feet guided by your heart. One of the challenges that a lot of people face is a feeling that they don't have enough time. And so we end up hurrying up because we feel like we don't have enough time, so we just rush through. The problem is, is that the more that you rush through things, the less time you have because our lists are endless and there's no way to ever check everything off of your list. So one way that I like to look at it is like sort of rocks in a jar. And this comes from organizational psychology with, I put a little Buddhist twist on it, but in organizational psychology, you can think about your time 
as being a jar. And you can think about all the rocks on the floor of your list of things to do. Big rocks, little rocks, little tiny pieces of sand. Oh my gosh, I need to like move the washing machine to the dryer. I need to get my car's tires rotated. Little things and then big things, like I need to call my mom. And what we can do is we start by putting the biggest rocks in first. So the things that matter most to you, whether or not they matter to society or to what the rules of our world say, the things that matter most to you that contribute to your well-being and the well-being of those around you, your physical health, your mental health, our world's health, those go in first, those big rocks. And for me, those big rocks may be something like if my child comes up to me and I'm in the middle of working, I put it down to look him in the eyes because it really matters to me that he knows that I care about him and that he's a priority. And it matters to me that he knows how to do that for somebody else, right? So that's a big rock in the jar that doesn't have any productivity at the end of it. Like there's no checkbox of point that I got there, but I'm going to put that rock in the jar first. And then leave some spaces around your rocks. Because one of the things that we do is when we're caught up in striving, we, we, we write all the way to the edge of the margin. We don't leave space in the margins, space in our life for being time, savoring time, taking in the good, as Rick Hansen talks about in terms of positive neuroplasticity and how important that is. That's time. So leaving some space between the rocks, not just taking lots and lots of rocks and seeing how much you can shove in. That is wise effort. What are your biggest rocks for you? And how do you find space in your life to savor? The second aspect of wise effort is a concept that I've been playing with called flexible perfectionism. And knowing where and when to be a perfectionist. If you are a manicurist, please be a perfectionist. If you are a surgeon, there are certain moments where you need to be a perfectionist. And sometimes your perfection is getting in the way of your values. So knowing when to dial up the perfection and when to dial it back. When I'm working on sound editing for these things, I'm a perfectionist. I want it to sound really good because I know that people won't listen if they don't like the, the quality of the sound. So we pay attention with a perfectionist ear to the sound and still we don't even get it perfect. That's same level of perfectionism. I may not apply to the perfection of my kitchen if my kids are making cookies because if I were to have a perfect kitchen, my kids may not be able to have the flexibility to explore and create uh, in their cooking. So flexible perfectionism. And then finally, wise effort involves taking in the good of your accomplishments along the way. Breathing in, we have arrived. Breathing out, we are home taking in the good of this moment and letting it download into your nervous system. All of us together watching, connected in this way, a group of skillful strivers that are going to go out in the world and take our values and put them into action. And taking in the good of that, which is good for your brain and good for your body and reinforces the behavior. Act as a behavioral psychology. So we want to reinforce ourselves when we're living out our values. And part of that is Rick Hansen's concept of taking in the good that we've talked about. Part of that is having a loving awareness that Jack and Trudy talk about of just the, the sweetness of being in loving awareness. And taking in the good of our accomplishments not only reinforces us, but it reinforces the right things. Uh, taking in the good of your values is reinforcing not the product or outcome, but really the process. So that you begin to develop a new skillful striving loop. And what that looks like is that the stressors still show up for you. You're still going to feel anxiety. You're still going to feel pressure. You're still going to feel all those parts of the Russian doll of like your parents' critic and your society's um, cultural standards. They're still going to be there. 
but you respond differently with your behavior. You respond from a place of values, a place of compassion, and a place of committed action, wise effort, so that you have a different result. You're watering different seeds and there's different fruit that will come to you. The fruit of an intrinsic reward from the inside, the fruit of feeling more connected, at peace and present in your life. And the fruit of being part of something that's bigger than you. If we go back to that timeline that we started with, right? The, the, what sparked your interest in joining the summit. I imagine we could take that timeline even further back to you that needed something. Early on in your life, you lost a sense of you and that needed and longed for something, maybe a belonging to be at peace in the world, to feel like you could be the full expression of you. And that connects not only to you, but it connects to your parents and your ancestors, the you that goes way, way, way back before you were born. And if we take that timeline of the future of your wishes for the future of how this summit may be beneficial to you and others, you can imagine that going way beyond you to past when you were dead, that, that your actions now will continue on in the people that you meet, in the planet, and the way that you impact the planet. It'll continue way on. And then there's you right here and right now that can hold both of that. You can hold both of it, two hands together. That breathing in, you have arrived in this moment, and breathing out, you are at home. And how do you want to act in your home, in your body, in this moment, on this planet? I hope that your actions are skillful, compassionate, flexible, oriented towards your values and about something bigger than you and in process. If you want to learn more about ACT, I encourage you to check out ACT Daily Journal. I encourage you to check out Jennifer Payne's talk, which is really going through the six processes of ACT and how she's adapted them for Black populations. It's a beautiful description of ACT. Many blessings. Thank you for joining me. And I am so excited for you. I think that many doors are going to open for you as a result of listening to the talks on the summit. It's an honor and delight to spend this time with you. Thank you.